Hi, everyone. Welcome to the second edition of the Fem Technology Summit. Um, I'm Arianna Kraft, the founder and producer of the summit, and I'll be guiding you through the next two days with our amazing array of moderators, panelists, and of course, our fantastic keynotes. We have individuals from over 50 countries tuning in, and last I checked, we had 1,400 of you that signed up to attend the event. There were a lot of last minute signups, which is great. We're so happy to have you all here. We have medical students, researchers, femtech founders, journalists, VCs, NGOs, and also complete novices just looking to know more and understand what femtech is. So in that spirit, why the summit? The Fem Technology Summit aims to provide a 360 degree perspective on innovation in women's health by bringing together stakeholders across the whole ecosystem to showcase the startup point of view, clinical insights, the research perspective, the patient journey, and talk about some of the most exciting innovations happening in healthcare. Um, the Fem Technology Summit began as my bachelor's thesis at ETH Zurich, and since then has grown to include a terrific team of 14 volunteers um, that I'd like to take a moment to thank now. Um, we have Laura Locher, Xuanzi Jia, Leah Plitz, Lane Karandi, Pauline Brocard, Arun Halas Dottir, Rahel Schmidt, Rachel Zito, Francesca Rosa, Anki Nidali, Lucas Reinhardt, Alina Hefflinger, Diane Blazer. Um, most of them are in attendance. Those who aren't are only not in attendance because they're doing medical rotations um, in the hospital. But so you, if you do come across any of them, um, be sure to say hi. I'm sure that they'd love to connect with you. We're also very grateful to the Roche Digital Innovation Lab hosting us today. For those of you in Switzerland, um, be sure to come by at 8 p.m. tomorrow. Um, there's a chance to meet in person at Clara. Uh, can you mute it? There's an echo. Can you mute it? There's an echo. <laughs> um, we'd also love to take the chance to thank our sponsors, um, the Bio Innovation Institute and Women at the Table, without whom none of this would be possible. Um, so we'd actually really encourage you to get in touch with our sponsors because um, the Bio Innovation Institute is a nonprofit that funds pre-commercial life science projects through grants and funds startups through fun founder-friendly convertible loans. Projects and startups are typically incubated at the BII facilities in Copenhagen with access to office and lab space. BII is primarily funded by the nonprofit Novo Nordisk Foundation and has established an extensive partner network to help support its startups and translational projects. BII actually recently launched a women's health initiative, um, which is particularly relevant to all the femtech startups attending here today. The women's health initiative aims to strengthen the European ecosystem for translational research and startups to address the high medical unmet need within women's health. Part of the women's health initiative activities are supported by a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Current funding opportunities from BII include the Bio Studio, which is um, for innovative academic principal investigators looking to take research to commercial stage and Venture Lab for early stage startups or startups to be. We'll be dropping the link uh, in the chat to both, both those initiatives later on so it, it's really easy for you to apply. But we're just very happy that they're sponsors because they do exactly the kind of translational and synergistic funding we're looking to catalyze here at Fem Technology. Then we have our returning gold sponsor, um, Women at the Table. Um, Women at the Table is a civil society organization which focuses on the economy, democratic government, sustainability, and technology, bringing women and transformative ideas to the table through the prism of innovation and technology. They have a special focus on AI right now, from policy frameworks at multilateral level to their feminist AI research network um, focused on the global south. They also have quite a few internships available. So if you're a student and you're looking for an internship, we'd really encourage you to get in touch with them. We'll also be dropping their contact details in the chat later on. Now onto the agenda for today. Um, what's on the agenda? We'll be talking about the future of fertility immediately after, followed by speed dating and virtual mingling for you all to get the chance to know each other. Then we have an amazing keynote on the economic case for investing in women's health research, a roundtable on the gender data health gap, um, a keynote on how male-centric medicine endangers women's health, followed by a larger mingling and networking session because, like I said, 1,400 of you signed up to attend, um, and we really want to give you the chance to all get to know each other. Before I hand it over to our moderator uh, 
for the future fertility panel, I just wanted to say a few words about why we chose to start with fertility. You may or may not be aware that fertility is also a marker of future health. Uh, it can be an indicator of future cardiovascular disease, of metabolic issues, but too often we look at fertility as just the process of trying to have a child, which is in itself an important process, but fertility should be examined within the prism of an entire life cycle of health. Reproductive health and general health should not be two separate siloed experiences because naturally they inform each other. So we hope as you embark on this journey over the next two days of the summit with us that you'll draw your own conclusions about how all these parts of women's health connect and how going forward, we can break down the silos between different facets of women's health to provide holistic care. Um, now, uh, I wanna introduce our fabulous moderator, uh, Stasha. Um, Stasha is a final year PhD student in genomic medicine at the University of Cambridge. Her research is focused on understanding the genetic architecture behind reproductive aging and fertility and their link to later life cardiometabolic health outcomes in women. The work by St Stasha and her collaborators led to the discovery of genetic sing signals that influence the age women begin menopause and the first evidence of our ability to extend reproductive lifespan and improve fertility through gene manipulation in mouse models. This has the potential to pave the way to fertility treatment that could extend the natural reproductive lifespan of women and to novel markers to improve the prediction of early menopause. Stasha, the floor is yours. Thank you for this introduction, Oriana. I am so excited to be here today with all of you. And it feels incredible to finally be uh, surrounded by such an inspiring community of professionals, students, entrepreneurs, who are on a daily basis working really hard to make revolutionary changes for women's health. What I'll try to do today is take you on a very brief journey uh, through scientific innovations around reproductive aging and menopause, and um, really try to poke your imagination uh, with what we are currently able to do uh, to better understand reproductive aging, uh, but also give you some hints on what future of fertility might hold. So um, let's, let's give it a go. I hope you can um, see my, my slides. So um, menopause is, is still a uh, taboo topic, even though it affects half of our population. And we don't really appreciate that there is such a um, wide variation in the ages that women experience it, starting from early 20s up to um, late 60s. Women are born with a, a fixed number of eggs in the ovary. And that number can only go down um, with age due to the egg loss. Both starting number and the rate of egg loss can differ in women, uh, which ultimately leads to the differences in when we as a women experience menopause. This decrease in the number and the quality of eggs leads to severe decline in fertility 10 years before menopause starts. Endocrine and imaging tests that are currently available in clinical practice can only um, record changes in ovarian function that have already taken place, which means that um, they disable early prediction and timely identification of, of women with um, early menopause or reduced reproductive lifespan. So um, I want you to imagine this 10% of women undergoing early menopause. This means that a woman with menopause at around 40 will start majorly struggling with fertility at the age of 30, but she has no ways um, to know about it. And guess what? The average age of, uh, to, of being a mother in the UK is 30. With a trend of delaying parenthood and increased demand in fertility treatments, which are often unaffordable, invasive, with limited success, um, which is most important here, it has never been more critical to understand determinants of fertility and menopause. Not only that menopause defines our fertility or infertility, um, but it has also a major impact on uh, women's health outcomes in their later life. Recent advances um, and recent surveys have shown that about 25% of women consider giving up work um, as a result of menopause symptoms. 
really, really scary numbers. So as, as part of our studies at the University of Cambridge, we work with um, around half a million of women. Uh, what we do is we use cutting edge genomic technologies to read their DNA, which then enabled us to identify about 300 regions of DNA that determine their fertility lifespan and ultimately timing of uh, menopause. So um, it is like a lottery, right? It is down to your unique genetic combination, your barcode, uh, where you have a battle of many mutations that each shift menopause to one direction or another earlier versus um, later. So where you are in this distribution will be down to the sum of all these effects. The power of this um, information is that we can use it to actually build the very first genetic prediction test that will inform every woman on timing of her menopause and allow us to identify those with early uh, menopause or premature ovarian failure. What a, uh, what a life-changing experience it would be for them to um, know their reproductive expectations so they can emotionally prepare for and plan their fertility journey, uh, but also get that treatment for early menopause and start with the timely prevention of um, all diseases that come hand in hand uh, with menopause. But we have to remember that um, ovary is such a precious organ. So we can't access it to um, understand its biology, meaning that the biopsies are, are, not, are, are not very welcome here because it's giving life, right? So um, us and other experts uh, in the field went even step further from just a prediction by making so-called ovarian organoids uh, from a stem cell. And you can see it here in this circle. Um, we call it um, ovary in a dish. So what we basically do is um, we uh, give instructions and we teach a stem cell how to become a mature egg. And what then um, that basically gives us limitless opportunities to understand how that single change in our DNA identified previously with genomic studies messes up a normal function of an egg and fertility. But we can also use it for the uh, discovery of novel drug, um, of novel drugs candidates, um, and also use it to design uh, therapeutic solutions uh, to enhance uh, fertility um, in women. Besides that, uh, we also use animal models to mimic the behavior of those mutations that we identified with human genomics. Um, so in this example here, we focus on two genes, on the genetic manipulation of two genes that we identified um, in our uh, previous studies. Um, by genetic manipulation, I mean either deletion, uh, complete deletion of those genes, or insertion of an extra copy of, of that particular um, gene. Um, so we can basically, we basically here show for the very first time ever, the ability to extend reproductive lifespan by doing these genetic uh, manipulations. And we do it by 25%. So you can see here a 25% longer reproductive lifespan in, in mouse models. We do that, but by either increasing the starting number um, of, um, of basically ovarian pool, as you can see here, or uh, on a, a contrary, uh, we are slowing down the rate of cell death or egg loss throughout um, um, reproductive uh, lifespan. Um, and this is the evidence uh, of a potential therapeutic target for enhancing ovarian stimulation in women undergoing um, IVF treatment through short-term inhibition of cell death. What it means in practice is basically we can help women release more eggs throughout the course of their IVF uh, journey, which will then ultimately, of course, increase the success of the, of the procedure. And obviously this uh, brings a lot of trial, trials and a lot of ethical questions that have to be answered. 
but it's a really fascinating uh, first step towards novel uh, infertility uh, therapeutic uh, solutions. But as we mentioned before, um, menopause is not only about fertility. Early menopause exposes women to many diseases, uh, such as uh, type 2 diabetes. And due to the increase in life expectancy, uh, women started spending a greater proportion uh, of their lives in ill health and disability. So um, what we are trying to do here is to use human genomics to understand whether these diseases, whether these health outcomes actually share genetic makeup with uh, menopause and with fertility genetic background. Um, and uh, this basically will um, enable us in future, and we are currently working on some strategies to design intervention uh, strategies to early on prevent or diminish the symptoms of these diseases that go hand in hand with menopause. We are, um, I guess, all aware that women's health has been neglected so much in past. And um, it is really time to start recognizing its importance. Um, it affects uh, half of our population, at least. Um, the findings from, from our group really have the potential to change the way we approach women's health and help clinicians manage those women with uh, confidence, with genetic guided uh, solutions. Uh, but obviously to make this happen as soon as possible, um, I really invite you to uh, join forces with us and bridge that current gap between existing policies, scientific advances and uh, commercial uh, solutions. So I'm leaving you here my, my email address, feel free to um, get in touch. And uh, just a, um, a, a sneaky uh, marketing uh, part, uh, I'm leaving here a screenshot of our most recent article that was published in, in Nature. Um, if you're thinking that we're talking about sausages or hot dogs here, um, we're not. I know that <laughs> this looks like that, but we're actually talking about uh, genetics of uh, ovarian aging. So uh, please um, go and have a read um, at the article. Um, so basically, this is the end of my, um, of my talk. And besides uh, telling you about the innovations that are happening in scientific world at the moment, I have a very special task today, and that is to dive into the conversation about the future of fertility uh, with ladies who have been contributing towards major disruption and transformation of women's health after, I would say, um, many dormant decades um, uh, in this field. So it is my great pleasure to present you the ladies who are at the forefront of uh, this battle. So uh, today with us, um, we have uh, Dr. Um, um, I'm sorry, do you still see my slides? Because I'm giving, I'm getting some messages, okay. Um, well, let's just continue. So today with us, um, we have Dr. Uh, Lynn Westpal, Dr. Helen uh, O'Neill, and uh, Lynn Chan. Uh, I would like to welcome you on this virtual stage with me. Hi, can we, uh, can we hear you well? Good morning. Hi. Hi. Good morning. Good afternoon. Yeah, it's very early in California. <laughs> oh no. Hi, Helen. Hi. Hi, welcome. So I think we can uh, start with Dr. Uh, Lynn Westpal. Uh, Dr. Lynn is a chief medical officer at Kind Body. Uh, kind Body Fertility is a fertility and family building benefits provider for employers offering comprehensive virtual and um, in-person care. I'm very uh, excited, excited for your talk, Lynn. And, um, the stage is, is yours now. Thank you. Um, I'm delighted to be here. So I'm just going to give you a little overview of Kind Body and what we've been doing. So let me see if I can share my slides. Um, Let's see. 
Can you see the slides? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so, kind body is um, a company that was started almost four years ago. Um, and the founder wanted to improve access to fertility and reproductive health care. And that is, that's our focus. Um, so we are really trying to improve access. Um, patients can either come to us directly. Um, we're also working to get employers to add it as a fertility and family benefit. So we're trying to improve access um, a number of ways. And we provide a very complete menu of fertility services. So we um, provide fertility assessments for both um, men and women or anyone who's, you know, who's interested in their fertility. Um, we do egg and embryo freezing, provide IUI and all IVF services, um, are very involved with um, providing services for the LGBTQ community, which tends to um, involve the donor and the, the surrogacy services. We also provide a lot of counseling. We know fertility treatment can be very stressful. Um, so we have therapists who are available. And we also do nutrition coaching, since nutrition is obviously a very important thing um, when someone is trying to conceive. And the difference between our clinic and other um, providers is that we really do provide more comprehensive care. So we provide gynecologic care along with our fertility services. We try to have our locations in very convenient places. So um, we, we try to be kind of in the middle of, of a city in an area where someone can just, you know, walk by. So for example, our first location in New York, um, right on Fifth Avenue, um, right next to a bunch of clothing stores. Um, so, you know, if someone's walking by, they can just come in, get some information. So it's a very easy entry just to come in and um, see what's going on in the clinic. It's not as intimidating as going into, you know, kind of a traditional big medical setting. Um, our facilities are very um, modern. They look more like a spa. They don't look like a typical medical facility. Um, we have our own electronic medical record that allows patients to book some of their appointments directly so they don't have to call in. We make it easy. And our um, electronic medical record has a very nice patient portal for people to see their labs and to get information on, you know, if they're going through treatment, what medications they need to do. We also have embedded into it videos. So if someone is doing injections, it goes through all the training and how to do that. Um, we're very proud of our providers, everyone who works in the clinic is very dedicated to our mission of providing very empathetic, empathetic care. And we have a lot of virtual services, which became even more important during COVID. People can um, access consults in um, all, all states at this point. And we're available 24 seven for our patients which is, you know, really important for people who are undergoing treatment. And we're focused on three things because these are, you know, I think what patients care about the most. 
Um, fertility services for many people um, are not covered currently. That's something that you know we're hoping to change, but we do have costs on our website. We try to be very transparent what the whole cost will be for someone going through. Quality is obviously really important. Patients want to have good outcomes, so we're focused on having the best quality in our clinics. Our um, IVF laboratories have the latest equipment, and so that is um, a really important thing um, that we focus on. And then, of course, the patient experience. So we make our clinics very welcoming. We have a lot of people who are focused on the the patient experience, and we do whatever we can to reduce the stress of going through the treatment. We have clinics um, all around the country. Um, so we have, you know, starting in New York, now we have a number in the Midwest and on the, and on the West Coast um, and are rapidly expanding. But by having clinics around the country. We also have some partner clinics. We can provide access um, in many, many locations um, around the country. And we are, um, you know, a woman led company. And so we're very focused on promoting uh, women's issues. Um, advocacy is an important part of our mission. Last month, we partnered with um, our professional organization, the ASRM, and then some other national organizations during National Infertility Week to raise awareness of um, infertility and just to make people, you know, realize that this is, um, you know, something that should be normalized. People should be able to discuss their fertility journey. And we were, um, this is a picture from Kind Body ringing the bell at the New York Stock Exchange um, last week. And I think it was great because it did get, you know, a lot of attention for the National Fertility Week. Um, so that is um, what we're doing at Kind Body. And again, I'm happy to be here this morning and look forward to the rest of the panel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lynn, for this introduction. It looks fascinating. Um, next, we have uh, Dr. Helen uh, O'Neill. Uh, she's a CEO and founder of Fertility, um, at home uh, hormone and fertility testing that provides data-driven and advanced insights into reproductive health, fertility decline, and the onset of uh, menopause. Um, welcome, Helen. Thank you so much for having me and it's really great to be here with such amazing other speakers and amazing people who are in the field and also just trying to make a difference. Thank you to the organizers also of the summit because it's I always find it so inspiring to be among like minded people. We have spent so much of our journey, I guess, battling and justifying and giving rationale for what it is we're building. And when we are in like minded company, it makes everything seem so much easier. Um, so I'm, I've clicked share slides and I've uploaded my slides. Can you see them? No. No? Oh, yes. Okay, great. thank you. Um, so as mentioned, I'm the CEO of Hertility Health. We are, um, we, we have been around for three years and it, uh, it founded by uh, women, uh, four women. I think that's one of the most fundamental aspects that we take for granted when it comes to building a company. When you're building something for yourself, for your friends, for your sisters and for your daughters, actually it means that every single day you bring more to it than you ever could if you were just building any old product. Um, we bring our, our passion, our experience, but also our expertise. We are on a mission to revolutionize women's health. Um, we know for a fact, and every one of you knows that healthcare was never designed for women. So rather than building on to an currently incredibly flawed healthcare system that relies on standards built around the male physiology, we have made it our mission to recreate a healthcare system that stands alone, that can stand as a reproductive and women's health companion from menstruation to menopause. And in order to do this, we need to raise our standards. We need to educate women and we need to be out there across all different areas in terms of education about our bodies, in terms of reinventing 
a healthcare model and also recreating the data. So we are a, can you move the, oh, I can move to the next slide. Um, we are a team of experts and we have made it our careers um, to understand more about reproductive physiology, about anatomy, about ovarian function, about um, reproductive genetics. And we have come so far in our understanding but what we all realized, certainly from my perspective as a, as a geneticist, Stasa will understand the high level of expectations that we have for any interpretation of a genetic link with an outcome. We have to interrogate an entire genome in order to make any extrapolations about what that may mean for somebody's health. And yet when it comes to women's health, we take a look, we have a feel, we make an assumption and we make possibly a diagnosis. And more often than not, that diagnosis is made far too late. So we have a team of experts, uh, predominantly women. Um, we do have men within the team, but for us, it's been actually exceptional to work with um, female leaders across the field. Um, even from our tech background, it's, it's amazing how a female perspective can have a have a, a, a big difference to the timeline on things. I'll give one example was that a male developer in our question around how long does your period last gave a drop down menu of one to 100. So we knew that actually it was a little bit easier and would speed things up if somebody didn't maybe assume that that would have would have killed somebody by the time they'd even attempted our uh, virtual health assessment. And I'm very fortunate to have uh, built this with my two co-founders, um, Dr. Natalie and my identical twin Deirdre. So we are um, not just about a test. We are not just about fertility. Um, as, again, as mentioned, we know that the fifth vital sign has been added to the World Health Organization list of vital signs, along with pulse, temperature, pallor, are your periods. Your periods are a looking glass into your overall reproductive health. And for us, just one arm of this is being able to do diagnostic testing. The second most important pillar to us are the treatments that we can provide for women. You. We, we say we give you the what's up without the, we don't give you the what's up without the what's next. And to, to me, that's very important. It's all very fine giving somebody test results, but really what people are looking for if they've come to you is answers. And so by providing an end-to-end -end treatment, diagnostics, uh, test, triage and solution, we hope that we can be there as a trusted single source of truth for women, no matter what their reproductive goals or no matter what stage they're at. The third pillar, pillar, which is the most important to us, is the data. We are collecting data that does not exist. We, as scientists, began this first with the truth-finding mission. What can we understand that we don't already know? What information is already out there that we can systematically review and analyze to say we are building upon a, upon a foundation? And we've done this across every facet of the business. But when it comes to actually looking into the individual studies and papers that have been published and are sometimes seminal pieces of literature that have, you know, go government and policy changing effects in terms of creating and setting diagnostic criteria and guidelines, the numbers of women involved in these studies is actually pathetic. So we are actually on the cusp of a generation of women who are using technology, are enabling themselves and have a curiosity to actually embark on that knowledge journey themselves and to enable us to prove out our clinical trials in a much better way. An interesting fact is that we actually started this as a clinical trial. We wanted to understand the underlying epidemiology, the underlying predictive factors that th when you cluster them together would be indicative of any one or other pathology. The first one we wanted to know really was, am I fertile or am I infertile? A seemingly simple question. And when the, um, when all non-essential clinics were closed down due to lockdown, we couldn't recruit women. And actually this served as in our favor because we wanted to continue with this research and we set a very basic, very basic web page, asking women that simple question, would you want to know what your fertility is? And without any advertising, without any marketing, we had over 7,000 women register their interest. They weren't, we, we weren't reaching out to them, they were looking for us. Women were searching for answers. And that to us was the, was the cue and the clue that this information shouldn't be behind a clinic wall. This information shouldn't be inaccessibly expensive. This information shouldn't just reside within the walls of a fertility clinic, whereby if you're 22, single and in a same-sex relationship, 
it is prohibitive in terms of its expense and also its justification. We wanted to recreate a healthcare system that was in the hands of women. The a next step in our journey was understanding if we want to understand what call, am I fertile or am I infertile? What are the things that could lead us to reduced fertility or infertility? Now, we started with um, that simple question. It very quickly escalated um, with even if you look on the NIH website, there are 11 different causes listed of female infertility, be it through anatomical reasons, ovarian reasons, anovulatory reasons, genetic reasons, uh, chromosomal uh, aberrations, uterine defects. There are many different reasons why somebody may be infertile. And to us, that was a key decision factor in incorporating many more details in what we asked every single woman when they presented. Because if somebody had a perfectly normal or within range hormone profile, but had blocked fallopian tubes or had a uterine defect, then we would be telling them, yeah, you're fertile. But the reality is no one test can actually tell whether you're fertile or not. It's a little bit of an inconvenient test when we know the only true test of fertility is actively trying to conceive. And for many, that's not exactly the, uh, the thing you want to do right now, but you do want to know and you do want to guarantee your future. So what we've ended up with is an incredibly comprehensive diagnostic and clinical decision tool that we start with before anybody is ever tested. The first step in our journey is understanding a comprehensive medical history, understanding any symptoms, biometrics or any menstrual pattern changes that could lead to a prediction of a certain diagnosis of a pathology. The second step is depending on that combination of symptoms and, and biometrics and um, menstrual patterns, we will then assign a tailored set of hormones to that individual. We have over 30 different panels of hormones, depending on whether somebody's answers potentially are suggestive of PCOS, whether their symptoms are potentially su suggestive of maybe um, thyroid condition, hypothalamic amenorrhea, the list goes on. In fact, we're very proud of the list of diagnostic um, capabilities that we have. And in order to do so, we have to build out a data set of not just one metric, as many of these temperature trackers or period calendars do, but all of the different things that could, in fact, lead to a potential diagnosis or a risk for a, th a certain pathology. After all, one in three women will have a reproductive pathology at some point in our lives. We have a highly dynamic reproductive system that doesn't just affect our uterus, our ovaries, but our entire metabolism, our sleep, our mood, our weight, our cognitive function, our heart, our bones. This is a very powerful system we're talking about. And so taking into account biometrics, biomarkers and pathologies are really what's important to us within this data set so that we can, can detect these risks, so that we can predict the onset of menopause and determine um, women's fertility parameters. Our algorithm actually can predict nine of the most common reproductive pathologies. Um, we have been proving out, in addition to our testing and the growing of the team, we have been proving out our clinical trials through um, through three different aspects, both in terms of our current fertility data set, our PCOS clinical trial and our endometriosis clinical trial. Our endometriosis um, clinical trial has been very exciting for us looking at our data. We can actually, this is not one of the nine, this is our 10th. We can actually predict endometriosis currently with 87% confidence non-invasively. Now, when you can imagine that um, endometriosis costs 8.2 billion per annum in the UK alone, and the only way of currently diagnosing it, which is still true, is to be, is through surgical in, in, uh, intervention, the idea that we can actually help signpost with this combination of risk factors and enable somebody to get to secondary care much sooner rather than eight years, which is the average diagnosis time, to me is a, a step forward in enabling women with trusting them with their symptoms, listening to their pain threshold, understanding what the combinations of all of these things mean in terms of their risk, and then getting them to secondary care much sooner. How do we do this? We meet women on the streets. We go out there and we talk to them in a language that they find funny, engaging. We're not going to be clinical. We're not going to be removed. We're not going to talk about algorithms to their face. We're going to talk about understanding 
listening and being there for them as a reproductive companion, no matter what their desired journey. We have an amazing team, which none of this would be possible without. And I want to thank you for your time today. We are just embarking on the beginning of an incredible revolution. We call it the reproductive revolution. And without such brilliant minds behind this and the engagement of all of the women who trust us with their diagnosis, we have managed to diagnose many women and transform their care. And so I'm very proud of the team that we've built this with. And I hope that this is just the beginning for us. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Helen. This is very exciting. And as you said, it's a privilege to, to be here together to start this conversation because uh, we're all working on this and there are always some gaps that we need to fill in. And I can definitely see you know, how four of us can collaborate for sure. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to the, uh, the next one hour. And our last uh, panelist is uh, Lena Chan. Uh, she is a, a CEO and a founder of Parla a digital health platform putting data and knowledge in women's hands. Um, they aim to revolutionize and reframe the conversations around fertility uh, and miscarriage. Uh, Lena, welcome. And uh, I will try to share my slides here. Hold on, let's see. Can you see the slides now? Let me try again. Not yet, but I think it takes a few seconds. Can you see it now? Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, well, thank you very much um, for, for all the organizers uh, for, for this amazing panel. It's been so great to um, already learn so much about what's already been researched and it's been done um, out there. It's, it's, it's really, really amazing and refreshing to me to be in a room with uh, people who understand the problem that we're solving and um, why this is so important. So, so thank you again. Um, I don't have a scientific background at all. Um, I started Parla actually um, from my very personal experience um, with fertility and pregnancy loss. Um, so, so I actually spent more than 10 years of my career in um, finance as an investor. And I didn't start thinking about having children until I was about 35, which I think is, is kind of a growing trend um, in, in, in women in our society. And as educated as I thought I was, um, as prepared as I thought I was, it was probably one of the hardest experiences I've ever gone through. And you know, we talk, we talk a lot about how to improve women's experience, and I think it is paramount that we do that. Um, so when I started trying, um, it took me a while to conceive. I then had a stillbirth. Um, I didn't have much diagnosis um, around it. Then I miscarried um, and it was literally because I was a bulldog in a China shop that I found the right doctors to, to help me. And I think one thing that um, we haven't touched upon yet, um, but it is extremely important that we keep in mind when we're treating women um, through these reproductive life stages and challenges is mental health. Um, a lot of women will experience emotional distress. They'll um, have higher rates of depression, anxiety, um, and that generally will, will lead to lower um, health um, and, and well-being outcomes. So uh, I go back to this slide, I think is very, very important. So, and I think all the work that we're doing about moving these, the fertility conversation to earlier or extending the life cycle is very important. Because if you look at, you know, what, what's, the, what's the growing number of women trying to have children? It's all later. Um, we're all thinking about having children um, a lot later. And unfortunately, um, and I'm sure you all know more very, very well, the, the rates of challenges are just going to be increasing as we start trying for children later. So rates of miscarriages, infertility, period problems, depression, et cetera, is all, all very much on the rise. 
Um, and for all the reasons that um, both Lynn and Helen talked about, I think right now our healthcare system really is broken. Um, women are only getting support after they experience a problem um, rather than actually knowing how to advocate for themselves earlier, understand their bodies earlier. Um, here in the UK, you have to miscarry three times before you see a specialist, which you know, if you look at the mental health impact of that, it's tremendous. Um, you, IVF is extremely expensive and in a way inaccessible to people. Um, and just kind of general knowledge of, of your body is, is not there until you actually face a problem. Um, so I think that's, that's a, a huge gap that we need to, to be thinking um, about closing. So I think our mission, as I hear everybody else talk about theirs, I think we very much share it, um, which is in enabling better access to women, um, helping them be a lot more proactive to it and make it as personalized as possible because you know, we're, we're all, all very different um, and our DNAs are very different. So our experiences will be very different physically and emotionally. Um, at Parla, we hope to make that dialogue with women about their reproductive health a lot earlier um, than I think most women experience it now. Most women, I think, engage with it once they're starting to struggle um, with um, fertility. But what we're trying to do is really kind of engage with them when they're not even thinking about that. They're just uh, having their period, understanding their bodies, and then um, when they're curious, trying to conceive and all the way to um, perimenopause and menopause. So, so really kind of being a companion for multiple years. Um, our approach takes uh, care in kind of like three, three things. Um, they're very important um, to, to us as a company and as a founder. And I touched upon the first one already, which is, which is mind. Um, I think we can, we can do a lot um, for, for women and there's still a lot more to be done in terms of helping them understand their bodies, but we can't, we can't ignore what happens to the emotional well-being of women. Um, we, we've seen women completely broken as they've not gone through IVF, uh, multiple pregnancy losses, and it's really important that we, we support them also um, with their mental health. Um, preconception is key. Um, I think we need to start shifting that dialogue to a lot earlier than when you're trying to conceive um, or even when you're already experiencing treatment. Uh, the sooner we engage in women in understanding their bodies, um, the most um, effect we can actually have. And we need to break taboos. Um, there are tons of taboos from, you know, I mean, the amount of different words you use to describe periods or pregnancy loss um, or infertility is, is, is really detrimental because taboo will have a very negative impact both on health, um, physical health outcomes, as well as mental health outcomes, because you don't have the words to advocate for yourself. You're awful. You usually are feeling shame. Um, you're feeling very isolated, which basically just delays um, getting, getting help. Um, so, you know, it's, we can, we can have some amazing products and, 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 um, uh, services out there. But if we don't help break those taboos, um, women won't have the access, they won't have the words, they won't know how to get that care. So it's really important that we completely change the narrative um, and mainstream a lot of the narrative um, around women's health. Um, so a big pillar um, for us in um, breaking those taboos and enabling access is learning um, and well-being. So we run, um, there's a lot of kind of, self, we, ha we're, we have an app, we have a lot of um, self-guided courses, but we also run um, cohort-based um, learning programs uh, with experts. And for us, what we've, we've been around now for um, just over three years. And what we've realized is that women, women come to us not with kind of, I have a fertility issue generally, but they tend to bucket in smaller, um, what we call user journeys or user pain points. So many are struggling with PCOS or endometriosis, pregnancy loss, about to embark on IVF. Um, and the needs that they need are very different for each one of those um, journeys. So we, um, we, we enable them, we let them meet each other, uh, and then we then connect them with experts. And the reason why that's very important is that typically taboo health topics uh, you can learn just as much from your peers as you can from um, an expert. Because for many women, um, it's that aha moment. It's like, oh my gosh, I'm not the only one going through this. So, um, you know, when I talk about um, how do we how to bridge the care gap for areas that are taboo, I think of three C's, um, communication, community, and compassion. Um, and you need to have those three um, to enable access. So, so it's one thing that we really focus on and really focus on the learning, the community, um, and, and the well-being. 
Um, access to experts, I think, is extremely important. I think to Helen's point of, um, you know, we can tell people what what the data is, but what what's next? Um, how how do you help me solve the problem that I have, or, or what do I do? So access to experts is extremely important. So we have um, from instant messaging um, to consults, uh, women to co who come to us can can get that. Um, uh, access and we really focus on mind and body. So we have fertility specialists, we have nutritionists, we have psychiatrists um, working with us. Um, and we also have uh, curated products. So we also have a fertility test, um, which we don't recommend all the time. So if somebody has had pregnancy loss, they probably will be working with us primarily around um, mental health. Um, but for other conditions, uh, if they if they want to know a little bit more about the fertility, um, we also sell tests and some products too um, that that might help them um, on their journey. Um, our impact, we've, um, we've, we have a more a, a digital first approach. So we have our community of users are in over 80 countries. Um, it's thousands of women who have um, sought us and um, engaged with us. And we hope to continue expanding on that um, in the next couple of years. So I will stop sharing and hopefully that works. Did that work? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> a little tricky. I'm like so much more used to Zoom than I am to hop in. Yeah, thank you. Thank you all. It's it's really empowering and, and revolutionary what your companies are, are doing. And I think it has never been more exciting to be working in this uh, sector. So I really don't want to postpone uh, our conversation anymore. Um, we have a very interesting topic today, which is future of fertility, but through eyes of personalization. And the sector is slowly but surely waking up. The awareness of clinicians, scientists, policymakers is growing. And um, we are starting to generate uh, big data, thanks to Helen as well, <laughs> uh, which in future will help guide clinical uh, decision. But what I'm interested in is what you found when you started your journey. Um, what has motivated you to start this? So before, before you were on the market, what was available for women that could play the role of what your product does um, now? And, and secondly, um, I want you to think about this question also from the perspective of why do you think this product, product didn't exist? Is it due to the lack of technology um, that is able or unable to tackle the challenge, lack of entrepreneurs interested in this market, lack of funding or, um, or you name it. Maybe we can start with, with you, Helen. Absolutely. Um, I think all of the above um, in terms of what has, what delayed it. Um, for me, I actually was quite surprised that nothing existed. I think I lived in a world of cutting edge research surrounded by world leading experts and assuming that these gods were, I guess, the forebearers of all of this knowledge, that they knew the answers to things. And only when I became, and I don't think anyone is an expert, when I became closer to expert in this area and I still had so many questions, I thought, they don't have the answers. Yeah. The textbooks don't have the answers. Why are we in such a poor state whereby actually it's not a case that the, the, the tools don't exist. We have very advanced tools. My, my main research area has been in genome editing. We can make minor changes within the genome to alter a genetic code, a sequence. And yet when it comes to, you know, a, even down to read the most rare of disease, genetic diseases, we actually have more cures for rare genetic diseases than we do for the most common women's health diseases. And when you look to asking, I guess, the doctors, why is this? They just say the, the, the just we just don't have the data yet. And I think there's just an over-reliance on excuse making when it comes to innovation in the area. I think until we have a combination of the two fields, which is, you know, science and clinical practice and bringing in technology to leverage that, then we won't actually succeed in moving forward. And, and to me, go, going to seek answers for myself and being in a very privileged position that I actually had access to experts, access to people in fertility clinics and not being able to come out with clear answers and saying I could never have afforded 
to do that. And I never would have easily found that answer hidden behind these walls. That is what really both surprised me, motivated me and inspired me to make the change and find the answers for myself. Well, what is really interesting to me is that both you and, and Lynn spent quite a lot of time in the um, academia. And um, it really is surprising that, you know, we have many experts, but as you said, not many of them are trying to, to tackle this from a, a translational point of view. You know, we are being satisfied with answers that don't really do much in, in, in practice. And what I'm interested in now, Lynn, from, from your perspective, you know, we have um, IVF um, um, from commercial point of view has been going on for, for quite some time now. Um, so, so you can also answer this question from, you know, in what way you're personalizing uh, the treatment of these women. And we will talk later about the challenges of those. We mentioned that there is such a wide spectrum of, of the conditions that we are working with. So the norm doesn't necessarily satisfy uh, all the uh, answers that we have right now. So maybe you can share with me your experience about, you know, what, what you found and what has inspired you to go into the commercial side of things rather than just staying in, in academia? So the very first IVF baby will be 44 in, in July. Um, so Louise Brown, who lives in the UK. And, you know, early on fertility care, um, you know, just was popping up in little locations and, um, and overall women's health care has just been very fragmented. Um, and so I don't think the focus was so much on the patient um, and definitely the patient experience, you know, the most of the clinics were designed just like regular medical clinics, right? Um, and, you know, and kind of the default for medical care has been you know, taking care of men. So women have always tended to be kind of an, an add-on. Um, so I think for fertility clinics were just kind of set up in that same model. And they, um, you know, were, were not designed, there weren't a lot of women who were involved in the design of these clinics and how to provide care to women. Um, so I you know, I saw this need to have care that was more comprehensive, um, that was more personalized, more focused on, you know, each individual experience. Um, and so, you know, having clinics that are just easy to get into and access, I think, um, reduces some of the stress of even getting information. So I, you know, one of the problems has been that just to go in and get some information about basic fertility, um, I think has been overwhelming for, for most people. Um, and so, you know, the other thing, you know, that we've tried to do is bring education out into the community. So partnering with local groups, um, we actually have um, a van that we used to take out before COVID where we would go partner with, um, with groups and draw AMH levels and just like be out talking to people as they walked by on the street about just general reproductive health. Um, and, you know, trying to really normalize the conversation and make it available where people are because, you know, it, it is a big barrier to like make an appointment, go in and to talk to someone. Um, so it's great, right, that, you know, people um, like Lena now in 80 countries is trying to make people get that information no matter where they live. Um, so even, you know, accessing care, if you're in um, an area that just doesn't have much in terms of medical services can make it really, really difficult. Um, so I, I think all of these um, things that people are working on just to highlight, um, you know, how common infertility is, how common, you know, miscarriages, endometriosis, all of these issues that, you know, people were afraid to talk about 
Um, so I think normalizing it, educating people from a young age, um, you know, hopefully we can catch some of these, you know, women who are at risk of premature ovarian um, insufficiency. You know, if you start talking to women in their 20s, you know, maybe we'll catch some of these women at an earlier age too um, and help them have, you know, meet the family goals that they, that they would really want. Yeah. And, you know, when we start talking about making this uh, less of a taboo topic and talking about the personalization is actually, you know, giving power to women to control their reproductive journey. And as you say, it's, it's about, you know, knowing on time so we can plan and we can avoid this uh, emotionally uh, draining journey, uh, which is invasive and um, time consuming, money consuming, etc. And um, of course, this, this personalization also ties in very well with the experience of women at, at work. Helen just mentioned that uh, her IT developer didn't really, he missed the scale quite a lot. And of course, us as women, we, we work for men, right? So we, we need them to understand uh, what we are going through. And uh, sometimes uh, they do, sometimes they don't. Um, so, and I mentioned earlier in my talk that about 25% of women actually consider giving up work because of uh, menopause symptoms. So uh, maybe a question for, for you, Lena. Um, um, can you tell us um, more from the experience with your clients, how does fertility impact um, uh, their time at work? You know, how, how should and how could the future um, of work culture related to fertility um, look like? And recently we, uh, we saw that the Spanish government approved a, a draft law that would make Spain the first European country to grant women days off uh, work because of menstrual pain, um, as well as um, extend access to, uh, to abortion. So um, I'm interested if you have, besides actual patients and women, do you have connection with, uh, with companies? And, and how are they, if you do, how are they opening up to support the fertility journey of their um, employees? And also maybe we can take some time to comment on the um, importance of the involvement of government, policymaker, policymakers, uh, VCs, um, as well as um, us scientists and, and men that we uh, work for. Yeah, no, absolutely. There are quite quite a few questions in there, so I'll tackle yeah, um, yeah, one at a time. I mean, in terms of um, HR and companies, I think, uh, especially in the last eighteen years, I've really loved a lot of the kind of headlines that we've seen. So Spain is one, New Zealand um, approving more time away from um, work and paid leave for pregnancy loss. Uh, increasingly, um, more governments following suit on that, or even just recognizing days off for period IVF. I think generally there is a higher awareness that it just takes a big toll on um, not just the woman, but the partner also, um, both physically and emotionally when they're going through these challenges. So it's really important that we support them both from a legislation, but also kind of um, on a company by company basis. Uh, during COVID, uh, we definitely saw a, a much higher interest across different employees um, to uh, address that gap. And a lot of them were kind of a bit shy about saying this is a women's health plan because they also don't want to kind of isolate anybody. Or um, so a lot of it, what we saw was it usually was wrapped into their well-being plan, and I think it's because a lot of the statistics and we and we and we ran a big survey um, across uh, women in the UK. We had more than 400, 400 respondents um, about what the impact was for them um, of fertility treatment treatments, um, pregnancy loss, and. Overall, about 80, it was more than 80% across each one of these challenges said that it did impact um, uh, their mental health, um, their productivity at work. So across the board, it either um, led to higher absences, poor performance, or um, a larger number of women wanting to um, leave the workplace. And if you go back to that chart that I showed you, right, women are trying for later. So if you look at the type, the, 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 the career progression of that woman, when she's leaving work or thinking about leaving work because of all these challenges, she's typically at a higher um, position. So she could be VP, she could be a managing director, she could be a CEO. Um, so that 
person for you to lose in the workplace is a lot harder to recruit. Um, and it's a lot more expensive to train. And I think there's a, a, a recognition of that. Um, and then, and, and if you get, if you add on menopause even more so, right, um, you're literally losing women at the peak of their careers. Uh, so I think there's a, a, a real recognition of that. And we are definitely seeing a lot more companies um, wanting to have a plan to make sure that women can get the, the, the support that they need um, as they're going through these different reproductive life stages. And what for me is, is refreshing is that they're not necessarily always just thinking about, okay, I'm going to finance that IVF. Um, but often they are recognizing that it's these different life stages. So from period um, to fertility, to pregnancy loss, to postpartum. Them, um, that something needs to be in place there um, for, for their well-being. So I think the trend is good. Um, there's probably still a little bit more that um, we can do, but I, it definitely probably is one of the times that I felt that there was, it's been a bigger item on, on their agenda. Um, in terms of collaboration, I think it's, it's, it's still shocking to me. I know I'm in a world of femtech, so everybody I talk to understand this problem. <laughs> um, the few times I step out of it, I'm like, oh my God. They don't realize this. So I think it's, it's we, we need to be careful not to be in our own bubble. Um, and it's surprising how even from an awareness standpoint, um, there's still a massive gap, even amongst women. Um, a lot of them don't even understand some of the conditions that Helen just talked about. So I think we need as a society, as educators, as science, um, really shift that dialogue. It's extremely important that this is normalized um, and that there, and, and we don't talk about it with shame um, because that is such a big um, barrier for, for, for normalizing it. So we need to, and that, that is not something that just one company can do. I think it's doing kind of the campaigns that Helen is doing where she's literally plastering it everywhere so that people are aware of it to companies engaging with that dialogue with their employees, um, to having, you know, the, the vans on the streets, but it's, it's, how do we normalize this? How do we get everybody talking about this? Um, it's, 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 it's the way forward. Helen, do you want to add something? I can see a big smile. <laughs> no, I, I mean, I just mirror everything Lena says. I think we're um, we're all in, on on a on a really important mission, and just backing each other is is a really important step in that too. Not competing with each other. I think we're actually we're all trying to solve different parts of the equation, and together, you know, getting the the, the first part of that equation is actually getting the voice out there and, and educating people. So. Maybe as a as a lecturer, I, I think <laughs> education is the, the most important thing. Many, many people call that marketing. And um, maybe it's the same thing. Yeah, and talking about um education, I, I also throughout my PhD I had a chance to talk uh, to a lot of women. And it's surprising how not many of them uh, actually know that the this uh, distribution of the menopausal age is so wide that we have about, as I mentioned before, 10% of women who go into menopause below 45, um, which is scary because if you start looking at the timeline, it is not about just menopause. It is about many other things that precede that timing of, of menopause, including um, infertility. Um, so I have a question for Lynn uh, uh, talking about this topic of education and, and the cases that are at the end of the distribution curve. So uh, we're talking here about personalizing the, the treatment. So I'm interested to know, um, Lynn, how do you cope with these less common cases in your clinic to ensure that everyone receives personalized uh, fertility journey? And, and, you know, where do you think the future of uh, diagnostics and tailored fertility approach is for these individuals. And, and you as, a, a, you know, as, as part of a kind body, how do you think it would be um, easy or difficult to implement these novel solutions that will help us identify those women on time? Is it um, also emotionally shocking for them? You know, how do we think about that whole journey of the introduction of the uh, personalized genetic or um, um, hormonal tests, then to implementation in the clinics, and then dealing with with the with the patients that are at the end of this distribution curve. So maybe you can, we can have like a little comparison on what we are doing at the moment, and and what do you think the future uh, will look like in terms of diagnostics? Um, currently, I, I think you know we just are not able to predict for most people as well as we would like to. So it's great, you know, that there are people who are 
doing research like you are and trying to improve our ability to predict. And that is frustrating for a lot of patients because many times we don't have answers, you know, have someone, you know, who comes in in their early 20s, you know, with diminished ovarian reserve. And, you know, there are a few things that we know to look for, but many times we don't have answers. Um, so that's, you know, it's frustrating for everyone. It's frustrating for the providers. It's frustrating for, for, the, for the patients. And, and it also, I think, does make it much more emotionally challenging um, when you don't have answers and, you know, you don't know why you're, you're seeing um, someone, you know, at a young age develop something that, that was unexpected. Um, I'm hopeful that because there is more interest and, you know, there is more funding in women's health that we will get these answers and get more information in the future. Um, I think, you know, that's really exciting. And hopefully then, you know, as we have more answers, um, we can improve our personalized care, you know, have more targeted treatments. Um, I mean, that's the other thing. Hopefully we'll have some other therapies that can benefit some of these people that are in these um, more difficult situations. Um, but right now, I mean, it's, it's very challenging for these patients and they do um, need a lot of emotional support um, as, you know, as they're going through, through the treatment. Um, so a lot and of maybe, it, maybe I, we need our clinical decision tool. We can help you. <laughs> maybe, we can work with you. maybe if if kind of body use our clinical decision tool, will help them. Will help you guys give people a bit more clarity. Yeah. So I, I think um, yeah. As much, I mean, the more information we can give patients, um, and the more understanding they have, I think you know it it does help them move forward um, in the process. And Helen, talking about this new potential collaboration between kind body and fertility, uh, let's talk about the, the the precision of the of the tests. You you mentioned uh, a number which is quite fascinating uh, because it's it, I think it's about eighty percent that we are satisfied with to go into the clinical space. And you mentioned I think eighty five, right? Uh, in terms of the precision of your test. So um, what I'm interested in, and, and I know from, from my experience also that, you know, it's a, it's a big battle. We, a big data in science exists, but big data in around women's health exists, but are we happy with them? Not really. We need much more power to be happy with those numbers and have successful translation into the clinical world. And um, what I would like to know is um, your experience about the heterogeneity um, of the results. We know that, um, you know, previous research and findings on sex hormones are very heterogeneous, points towards um, misinterpreting, pointing towards um, message messages that can be interpreted in two or multiple different ways. And then we have another layer of complexity where we have um, um, other ancestries. So right now, the big data that we are working on is mostly a European base, right? But um, previous studies um, show that if we start diving into the trans-ethnic spectrum, we can find a lot more and actually boost the power that we are currently have. So um, my question here relates to, you know, how do you currently deal with the heterogeneity of the results, not only from the um, and, uh, ethnic perspective, but also from, you know, what we know about um, hormones. Um, you know question. that U-shaped curve? <laughs> so maybe we can talk about that, you know? Yeah. I mean, actually, we, we have um, our, our first, um, I guess, point of call always is to research the current understanding in the literature and what's available out there so that we don't recreate the wheel we then interrogate the literature to see whether it's not whether it's reliable or not one thing that we've found is that if we rely on assumptions and trust that truth data is in fact truth data we will actually start in the, on the wrong foot and when we look at even um the hormone, the, this reference ranges by which we uh, rely on for hormone profiling, many of these reference ranges have been set of either men or a few, uh, a few men 
or a small collection of women without uh, stratifying appropriately according to age, pathology or any reproductive history, uh, including ethnicity and background. So one of the first things that we've done as part of our, we we run many many different um, clinical research studies. The first is that we are redefining reference ranges according to somebody's age, um, pathology and background. In order to do that, we need a very, very rich data set. I think when we look at the differences in data sets and ensuring diversity, the two most important things you have to remember are, one, if you if you have so much diversity within your data set or enough diversity within your data set, but you're not stratifying according to each individual group, then you're still not rich enough in your understanding for those individual groups. It's it's great to be diverse in your data set, but you still need to serve each of those groups and say, what is what is the baseline reference value by which we can say is normal within range or out of range for this group of individuals, whether it's higher or lower, rather than clumping everyone together and and waiting till we get this beautiful bell-shaped curve and saying that we've got outliers we don't know why there's outliers but let let's be happy with that that everyone lives within the bell curve and i think that is a really important distinction in terms of first collection of data and two interpretation of data so that's one thing we're really committed to doing is understanding not just that we have differences in our hormone profiles but a, a but also in our prevalences towards different pathologies, be there be they uterine um, adhesions or or hormone um, uh, reference levels, we are um, we already know that there's differences in our hormone profiles, a diurnal effect, which is that you have a different level in the morning as you do in the in the evening. So understanding the levels of complexity by which we interpret hormones is actually very very important. Um, in, including the, the source of the source of blood, um, we ran a clinical concordance study looking at the relative reliability of different testing methods to ensure that we we were absolutely at a base level. And this, to us, though it's taken us so much time, and it hasn't added any value to the company, what it has has added is value to our ability to hold our heads up and say, if there is something that we can look at to prove, to make sure we are being as honest, as true, and as scientifically integral to our mission, we are doing it. And I think that's not what many companies don't have. They have KPIs, they have cogs to reduce, they've got people to, you know, teams to build. And and we've got all of those things, but we've also got to, we've got one chance to do this right. So unless we start with a really solid foundation, we're not going to get it right. And Helen, what about partners' data? You know, we are we're here in a, in a little bubble talking only about um, women's health. But you know, if we talk about fertility, mm-hmm. it's actually not only us, and it shouldn't 50%. be only us because history has been shown that it is us. But it's actually you know very much more complex than that. Uh, so uh, maybe fo- just a follow up uh, question is you know. Um, do you think, uh, you know, in future, uh, as, as a long-term or short-term strategy uh, on, on working with uh, males' data and, and trying to understand how they work together to, to actually have that fertility picture, you know, full, not only half of it? Absolutely. Um, we already know that it's not just about the egg. Um, it, the egg is the largest cell in the body and the sperm may, be, may well be the smallest cell in the body. What that tells us about evolution, we can we can only guess. But we do know that that small cell um, does contain 50% of the DNA necessary for fertilization to occur. And that the there are epigenetic changes that can happen to male sperm because of their lifestyle effects. And so all of these things are very important in determining the overall health and preconception care is, as Lena has said, is is one of the most fundamental aspects to overall conception and reproductive health and, and neonatal outcomes as well. We are later this year going to be introducing sperm testing, so we will be able to look at we will be able to look at, at um, both sides of of the picture. To me, as as a sister of, I have four brothers, uh, so men's health is very important to me also. Um, and our lack of, I guess, insight into l- allowing us to say that, that in almost 40 to 40 to 50 percent of cases of infertility, it is actually a male factor. To me, if I can stop women undergoing invasive uh, procedures 
prior to what could be a possibly even enjoyably enjoyable ex, um, examination for a man is it, it would be a, a great thing to do. Far too many women experience multiple tests and invasive procedures about their fertility before anyone ever turns to the man and says, maybe let's look, maybe let's look at the sperm. Yeah. Amazing. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, and and Lina, uh, you mentioned uh, um, that Parla also offers a fertility prediction test, uh, but we didn't really talk much about um, what data are actually be behind it. So maybe you can quickly touch upon that. And also, um, um, I would like you to, to comment on, you know, share with us your opinion about how do you think uh, and, and whether you have any plans about how we can integrate this information into women's general health profiles, not only related to, to fertility. And, and, you know, what does that mean for family planning? What does that mean for prevention of other diseases, uh, potential development of therapeutics that are fertility and menopause related? Yeah, absolutely. So um, our fertility test tests um, eight markers, uh, eight hormone markers. The, the typical one that you would get in an IVF clinic, um, actually during the pandemic, um, it's when we actually had a step change in selling our tests into IVF clinics. So it's the standard AMH, FSH, LH, I mean, the, the, usual, the usual ones. Um, and what we're trying to do is um, basically tell women uh, a, a sense of their ovarian reserve, um, also thyroid health. Uh, also, if they there's a series of questionnaire um, that they fill out um, that we can also indicate if they have a higher chance of having PCOS um, or endometriosis. So it's really kind of helping them flag um, their, if there's any issues that they could potentially have. Um, I think it's really for us the preconception part is very very important. So whenever we connect them with an expert, we make sure that they are also. Um, letting us uh, get getting the support from a potential nutritionist or a, a therapist. So when they create an account with us, we'll be asking questions not just only about their period, um, but we'll also be asking them questions about their um, how they're feeling emotionally. So if, whether they have anxiety, stress. And again, it's, it's, it's very much a user reported marker, but at least it gives us a sense of when this person comes to us, how distressed are they? Um, and then usually they'll also tell us how long they've been trying, um, if they've had a pregnancy loss or not. And what that enables us to, to have a sense of is the experience of this person beyond um, just kind of what they've seen in the clinic. Uh, and, and that then enables us to give them, give them a hint of, okay, before you go down the clinical path, maybe you should be looking at supporting your mental health. And I think that that came very much from my own personal experience because, um, and I am eternally grateful for the OBGYN that I finally met um, and then who supported me in finally having my children. Um, but when I walked in the office and I saw him, I mean, he, he basically said, I don't think you should do any treatments right now. Um, we need to make sure that you're in the right mind, mind state. And, and it's so rare for you to go into a doctor's office and them not just already to get you to do some, some sort of treatment. And I think it's because he recognized um, and, you know, perhaps for me, because I have had, I had at that point had multiple pregnancy losses. Um, there was one study in the twenties, like ages ago, um, that actually showed that if you supported women, more, more number of scans, um, more number of, um, uh, meetings with obstetricians, you actually could improve outcome. Um, there's been no other study since then, uh, but I think he, you know, he's he he runs one of the largest um, uh, multiple miscarriage clinics here in the UK, and also a, a very large um, IVF um, clinic under the NHS. But I think he recognizes that it's so important for you to think about all these other markers. So for us, um, when somebody comes to order the fertility test, they're also giving us data around their emotional state. Um, and then also we ask things like weight, if they smoke, if they, if, how much do, do they drink, et cetera. Because I think it's just really important for you to get that whole, whole picture so that you can um, understand beyond just fertility, what are some of the things that they're struggling with. So it looks like he is one of the, the rare ones. So I would like to tie that into uh, a topic of um, your startup being direct, direct to consumer. And it's really interesting because all of, most of you are actually uh, from clinical or academic background. Uh, and I would assume that, you know, you would know uh, that probably clinicians do have sense of, you know, how they should talk about these topics and 
you know, that the acceptance rate would be higher on, on that side. But actually, it looks like that the story is very different. And the patients who are going through this experience are um, way more acceptable to the novelties and innovations in this space. So um, maybe you can share with us, and um, starting from, from uh, Helen, what do you think it's, it's so appealing about selling directly to, um, to patients? Do you think that you know, physicians in generally are not sufficiently involved in innovation and, and why that is, if it's true, or maybe... Um, I, I think it's just a different way of looking at how how we are equipped right now. We are so used to having every bit of information that we can in, in the palm of our hands within minutes. Um, we are used to being able to order the most obscure of items and it arrives at our house the next day, if not that day. We are so used to being served across all elements of our life for really quite trivial things. And yet when it comes to answers about our own bodies, we are ill-equipped and the information just isn't necessarily ready to hand. So I think um, going directly to people, um, first you have to think about what the difference is between treating people versus proactively um, engaging with your health. And I think there's, there for us, when we started out, we first wanted to ascertain why someone was there were they just curious about their reproductive health were they actively trying to conceive were they experiencing symptoms or were they planning for the future to maybe freeze their eggs or whatever and to, to us asking that very first question was important to us understanding why how we could help them in their next stages of their journey but what we when we spoke with people they thought surely it's they all said surely it's only those who are actively trying to conceive that are going to come to you and in fact actually the, the majority of women in the first instance were women who were just curious about their reproductive health and it to me it fed into the knowledge in myself that we are innately curious about our fertility it's something that we get asked about repeatedly you get you reach a certain age and people are asking when are you going to settle down any babies yet are you going to conceive you know as soon as you're in a relationship with somebody, people say, you know, is, is this the one asking whether this is going to be a relationship that leads to to children? We are we're in a very it's a very pervasive type of pressure on women. And so we have to take into account that many women just are curious and you don't have you shouldn't have to justify having symptoms or being ill or being actively trying in order to have knowledge about your reproductive health. So it's it's not that we that the doctors aren't prepared to innovate. I think doctors would be willing to. Again, when we when we consulted with many, many experts, we were very fortunate to have so many in our in our network about, you know, how to make this the best predictive model it could be. And one thing I always felt in talking to clinicians would was, you know, I, what are your thoughts? What do you think about this? Showing them all the multiple layers of the decision trees and the algorithms and everything that's the research that had gone into it. And every one of them said, this is amazing. 11 out of 10, this is exactly what's needed. And to me, that was so such a relief because you think that you're going to be stepping on toes. And the reality is these are busy, busy toes and they're dancing to their own busy clinics. And they're happy that somebody is actually looking out, looking to innovate and make ways that can improve their improve the way their clinic may run. Amazing. Thank you so much. I think it's um, time to go to Q&A uh, from the uh, audience. So we have some questions here. Um, I'll start with the first one. I'm not really sure um, whether we will understand this as the um, um, person intended to, but let's see. So um, the first question is, do you see a space for a choice-based product related to fertility coming in the near future? And do you think technology will ever allow us a longer timeline? I assume uh, we mean that by, you know, extending um, that reproductive uh, lifespan. Um, I guess, Lynn, maybe um, we can start um, with you. Um, I think in the future, there hopefully will be therapies and things that can extend um, the longer timeline. Um, a lot of my um, initial research was for cancer patients. And, you know, so I started doing egg freezing 
for cancer patients back in 1998. So um, long before it was um, considered kind of a standard procedure. And, you know, for the cancer patients, we, you know, we knew that getting chemotherapy often would put them into early menopause. Um, and, you know, people are doing research now to see if there are ways that we can protect the ovary during chemotherapy. Um, so hopefully for that group of patients, you know, we'll have something available so that chemotherapy won't put them into early menopause. Um, and they won't have to do something invasive like egg freezing right before they're gonna have their, their cancer treatment. Um, for women who are you know, not in that situation, who just want to extend or have a longer reproductive lifespan, um, I, you know, I'm hoping with some of these new therapies that people are looking at um, and you know, looking at different genetic markers that we will get there. Um, I, I don't see anything that's going to be available in the in the near future. Um, and you know, and the other issue with you know any type of treatment um, where you're looking where it relates to fertility is you're worried about safety issues, right? So you don't know the potential impact that this could have. Um, on a pregnancy. So, you know, I think that's why some of these things need to move very, very carefully to, to make sure that, you know, we're not doing anything that would impact the, the health of the children. Um, so I, you know, I know there's a lot of um, anxiety with current treatments like egg freezing, you know, not knowing until you actually go to use them, how successful you're going to be. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, we've gotten better and better at egg freezing, but there isn't anything available right now that is going to be a guarantee for pregnancy in the future. Yeah, talking about the, you know, um, how easy it would be to start with therapeutics that will extend fertility. Um, I think menopause uh, gave us a really tough job because um, if we look at the genetics of menopause and infertility in general, um, there is about 80 to 90 percent of genes that are determining the age of menopause being uh, driven by DNA repair mechanism. Mm -hmm. And um, we know how DNA repair is so crucial for our body, not not only for a reproductive system. So um, it's really challenging if you start playing around it, um, how much that will impact uh the rest of our body and uh, Helen will probably know more than me about, you know, about gene editing and, you know, especially if it comes and if it's related to DNA repair being edited. So, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward. I'm excited, but very nervous uh, about what future will bring in that area. Um, we have a lot of questions for Helen, actually, and uh, um, I'll start because we recently talked about it and um, about sensitivity and specificity of, of the test. So um, um, we have a question from the audience uh, related to uh, screening tests and about the acceptable threshold for accuracy, um, referring to sensitivity and specificity. Sorry, was that a question? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, um, I think I think we already discussed that, but you know, okay. what is what is accept, acceptable threshold? That is the question. Um, I, I, so uh, the answer is different across um, the different pathologies you're screening for. We already know that for some, when we have when we when a combination of biometrics, um, be it weight, exercise prevalence, or um, smoking or drinking um, habits, or uh, symptoms and also your menstrual cycle disturbances or, or, or normalities or abnormalities, it, we already know that the combinations of some of these can, can lead to a potential you know, prediction of a condition. What, we then, what would then be done, and these are according to international diagnostic criteria and guidelines, what is then classically done is you do a blood test in order to confirm it. And then what is the, the, the third pillar of that screening and, and then diagnosis is being able to do a physical examination of it. So for some of the pathologies that we are looking at and some of the um, reproductive um, conditions, many of them can be confirmed with a blood test. When you look at 
thyroid related issues if somebody has all of the classic symptoms of hypo or hyperthyroidism and then we test their thyroid and they have out of range hormones well then you kind of have a you have you're closing the loop on your on your diagnosis there for others like pcos we know that a an elevated amh in the um in combination with other um out of range hormones is a likely, highly likely, almost surrogate for a scan. However, we are in our in our trials not relying on just the endocrino endocrinological signature in in combination with the symptoms. We are actually closing it out by doing scanning in order to have that trio. So it, it really, in terms of the um, the sensitivity and specificity, it actually it, it differs depending on what it is we're trying to actually um, uncover within that person and what you would then deem sufficient enough information to move forward to the next stage, if that makes sense. Yeah. It's kind of on a, I think, I think it's very important that everything is on a case by case basis. When we look at some of the guidelines, the nice guidelines, for example, um, we're missing people based on assuming on the assumption that they should all tick, um, you know, three boxes and what we've seen is actually some of the known predictors are actually quite poor predictors um, for these patho pathologies and there are less well-known predictors that that we see time and time again in those people who have that um, have that uh, diagnosis. And we have uh, one last question for um, Lena uh, from an uh, entrepreneurial point of view. Uh, so um, what was your main pain point when conceiving and launching Parla? Um, Backing the concept with medical specialists, finding investors, etc. Um, well, how many? How many? <laughs> um, actually, it was, you know, I think, very similar to Helen. We were very, very lucky to find some amazing doctors uh, across the board, most of them women. Uh, and I think because a lot of them themselves were quite frustrated within their own systems um, that they weren't able to get the data or get uh, the impact that they had. So I think from actually getting advisors, et cetera, it was, um, it wasn't, it wasn't super hard. Uh, fundraising, it was probably a mixed bag. Um, I think there's still, unfortunately, a lot of capital that's held um, primarily by um, male dominated funds, um, which even though you say this, this, the, the problem I'm trying to solve is going to affect 50% of the population, they still think it's niche. Um, and you know, and sometimes I think even the word femtech uh, can can be positive but negative at the same time. So I think it's it's positive in the sense that it um, people can quickly wrap their heads around what it means, um, but more often than not, people will think that it's something that's very very small. Uh, so I think fundraising was something that it was always kind of a bit um, dependent on the audience that that that, that we saw. And um, I think just hiring the right team also is 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 a is a big thing for any founder. Um, just making sure that you're getting the right person um, with the right values, um, who wants to you know who who's aligned with your passion. Um, that's it, it's the team that carries it. Um, so that's one of the key things that um, we need to make sure that uh, any any founding company will care a lot about is the team. And maybe now talking about the team, just to close this this fantastic panel discussion, if you can give us a, a very brief last message on um, if you have any recommendations or messages to um, students or potential young entrepreneurs who are just embarking on their entrepreneurial journey, uh, what to look for, uh, where to find inspiration, you know, um, yeah. Helen, you can start. Yeah, I think um, I think like, I guess the advice is different depending on who who it's to. If you're a student or if you're an embarking on being an entrepreneur, I think many people assume that given your background, you should go down a given route. And actually, we're very unimaginative when it comes to career pathways, certainly for scientists. Um, you either become, you're either in, in these binary roles of academia or industry. And the reality is, actually, if you choose all of the things that you love, to, to me, it was education and lecturing and speaking to people and doing research. You can actually combine all of them. So long as you're, you're with, you, you know, if, you, if these are things you love, then actually you're kind of in your comfort zone every day. But taking the pieces that you aren't good at and that you don't ever really enjoy, really, and relying on people who, who find those amazing, you will actually build out the perfect team. Instead of struggling with trying to be the best at every single pillar, it's actually better that you are that you could be the central core pillar that understands everything that you know about what you need to build. And for the bits that you don't know, you get support. Lynn, message from you. 
I think it's really important to find a really good mentor, someone who, you know, can be your cheerleader. Um, so, you know, identify someone who you can just, you know, throw ideas off of. Um, and then the other thing that I think is really helpful is, you know, just to talk to as many different people in different areas, as, you know, if you're trying to figure out what you are interested in, you know, just have coffee or have a discussion with, you know, people in all different areas. Um, and, you know, you learn, you make connections. Um, I think sometimes people don't realize how important it is to build these networks. Um, and, you know, that is how sometimes you find these great ideas or collaborations is just having this really wide net. So um, I think being able to network and finding your your cheerleader, I think are the, the big things um, to help, especially, you know, as you're starting a career. And maybe uh, one last note from Lena, yeah. Uh, for me, I think it's, think about, you know, work on something that you're really, really passionate about. Because um, I think, especially on those very early days, um, there's, it's a lot going on. Um, you're not getting paid a lot, you're getting a lot of no's, and you really need to believe in that compass. Um, and so don't build something like, oh, I want to make all this money. Like the money will come if you're building something that you're extremely, extremely passionate about. So for me, it's that. It's find what is that North Star? What's that passion that you really have? Because chances are, if you have that passion, you'll know the, the, the user pain points. Um, you'll know what you're trying to build. Um, and it would just make that journey a lot, a lot easier. Thank you so much. And, and thank you for this uh, fruitful and amazing conversation. I definitely learned a lot today. Um, and I think it's time now to invite uh, Oriana back to the, uh, our little virtual stage. Yeah. To take over. Hi. Hi, guys. Yeah. Well, first of all, I just wanted to thank all of you for that amazing opening panel. Um, honestly, Helen, Lena, Lynn, Stasha, it was incredibly insightful. I know I learned a lot and reading through all the comments from the audience, they learned a lot too. Um, I loved your comment, Helen, to your point about not just clumping everyone together when collecting data, but that we have one chance to do this right and how you're working to redefine the reference layer. Um, and Lena, about taking into account user reported markers to take into account the emotional state um, of patients, not just you know clinical biomarkers and how important that is. Um, and Stasha, how you said that 25% of women are thinking of giving up work because of menopause symptoms leading us to lead women at the peak of their careers. I think we've all with menopause really seen there's huge space for innovation. Um, and actually, uh, Lynn, I wanted to close with what you just said um, about how important it is um, to network and to find your cheerleader. And that's the most important part um, because actually that's a perfect segue into our next portion of the summit, uh, which is the virtual mingling. Um, so for those of you who wanna recaffeinate, I completely understand, <laughs> take 15 minutes and then come back um, for a keynote on the economic case for investing in women's health, which you definitely won't wanna miss. But if you're um, as energized as I am, hand, head over to the handshake button um, and get the chance to meet all the other incredible attendees. That was my favorite part of the last summit and yeah. Thank you guys so much again for that opening panel. Thank you so much for a great panel. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Bye. See you guys in 15 minutes. Bye. See you.